everyone, my name is Holden Hardman. Thank you so much for joining me again for another video. My friends and I just made a video where we watched the movie Soul for the very first time. I think if you watch that video, you can definitely tell I was still in the processing phase by the time we actually started talking about it. I hadn't really had the time to digest that kind of movie yet. Well, I've had some time to process it and collect some of my thoughts on it. And then I saw this Little Light Studios video pop up on my recommended feed called Soul Secrets exposed. If you're unfamiliar with them, they're the guys that brought us Satan's Endgame Secrets of the Avengers that I based my God in the MCU series on. They basically made the argument that the MCU is filled with anti-God themes, imageries, and philosophies, all designed to convince you to turn away and reject God and embrace Satan. I was working my way through that series when I got to the Black Panther portion of it, and it was right at that time that Chadwick Boseman had passed away. So I did a short tribute to him and then kind of ended it after that, mostly because the arguments that were made were starting to get very repetitive, and ending it when Chadwick Boseman passed away felt like it was time to close that chapter. This was three or four months ago, so I don't know if I'm going to finish that off or not. Anyways, I saw the video that they did about Soul and I decided to watch it. It's a little over an hour, it's the same type of things, and I'm not going to commit to multiple videos covering Soul, so I am going to skip around a bit, but I am going to try and talk about their main points. For context, I am a Christian, I believe in God, and I accept Jesus as the living Son of God. That being said, I have spent a lot of time on this channel criticizing fundamentalist Christians, uh, fundamentalist Christian groups, faith healers, etc., that I think do more damage to the image of Christianity and therefore Christ than it does good. My issue with Little Light Studios is that they make connections that aren't there, like misquoting characters, removing context, apophenia, and just blatantly miss the point of many movies. The recurring theme that I have found in their videos is that unless a movie is explicitly Christian with explicitly Christian themes, then it is evil. Nearly all, if not all, of Hollywood movies are satanic or have subliminally evil messages. The Illuminati controls everything. All entertainment is evil unless God is at the forefront from a Christian perspective. This means anything influenced by Eastern culture, abstract fiction, religious fiction, mythologies, even uh, a lot of science fiction are all wrong, even if the messages are blatantly Christian. Messages like loving thy neighbor, forgiveness, compassion. I reject this fully. I've used this quote before, but G.K. Chesterton, who is a renowned Christian author, said, fairy tales are more than true, not because they tell us that dragons exist, but because they tell us that dragons can be beaten. And that is precisely my stance on fiction and storytelling. These guys have even criticized the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis. Despite it being blatant Christian allegory, and in my opinion, sometimes a little too on the nose about it. It is finished. They criticize it because there's a witch in it that uses magic. We'll talk about that a little more later on. Now don't get me wrong, I have issues with Hollywood, many movies, and the messages that they may be trying to convey. I agree that there seems to be a Hollywood culture or maybe a LA type of culture that focuses so much on the self and narcissism, and those things are wrong and they absolutely should be called out. However, filmmaking is much more complex than just a singular Hollywood entity. There are writers, directors, executive producers, actors, distributors, etc. All of which have different backgrounds, different stories to tell, different religious beliefs. For every invention of lying, which is an atheist standpoint on life. Why don't you just tell me what the man in the sky wants? There is no man in the sky. Why did you say there was? I couldn't stand the look on my mum's face when she was dying. There is a silence by Scorsese, or a Ben-Hur remake, or a Passion of the Christ, or the Son of God. Our Lord said to them, go ye into the whole world and preach the gospel to every living creature. There's all these lamentations from Christians that feel like they're not being represented enough in Hollywood movies, or that high quality movies aren't being made for them, and neither of which is true. I've criticized Christian media in other videos, but it does seem like things are getting better. Here are a few movies that were very popular for traditional Christians and therefore profitable, which is what Hollywood wants. Business. It's show business. These are just a few from the past five or six years, many of which I've seen. The Ben-Hur remake, which I mentioned earlier, which I actually really enjoyed. War Room, 90 Minutes in Heaven, Risen, Hacksaw Ridge, The Shack, The Case for Christ, The Star, I Can Only Imagine, 
Paul, Apostle of Christ, to name a few. These range in their star power and production value. But the big issue with Christian media is that they want to appease the general American Christian audience. So for a group that typically talks about their dislike for political correctness, Christian media can be very bashful when it comes to being truly emboldened, creative, and different. We're going to talk about some of this along the way. Anyway, let's go ahead and get started. What's up, everybody? Thank you for joining us at LED Live. Today, we're going to be talking about what is the deception behind the movie Soul? Oh, I forgot to say, because of their perspective on Hollywood and films, they always enter these discussions with a presupposition. That is to say that they have the assumption beforehand that all films are anti-God or anti-Christian, and therefore they just have to try and seek it out. It's there, they just have to find it. It's what causes some of their far-reaching arguments. First of all, I want to talk about the creator of the show. He's also the, he's, his name is Pete Doctor, with an E-R, Doctor. He's the creator of Monsters, Inc., Inside Out, Up, Soul, and maybe a couple more. It says, during an interview in 2009, Doctor confirmed that he is a Christian and said that it influences his work. However, he went on to say that he did not envision himself ever creating a Christian movie about, about the relationship between his faith and his filmmaking. Doctor says, I don't think people in any way, shape, or form like to be lectured to. When people go to a movie, they want to see some sort of experience of themselves on the, on the screen. They don't come to be taught. So in that sense, and in terms of any sort of beliefs, I don't want to feel as though I'm ever lecturing or putting an agenda forth. Wait, what? You know, he works for Pixar, and he's a Christian, and he doesn't want to use his talent for the Lord. I actually get what Pete Doctor is saying. He says his Christianity affects his work, but he probably won't make an explicitly Christian movie. It reminds me of the band Anne Berlin back in the day. They had Christian lyrics in many of their songs, but didn't want to be labeled as a Christian band. They wanted to be a good band that also happened to be Christians. The reason for this is that if you go on saying that you're a Christian such and such, an artist, a musician, filmmaker, whatever, you're essentially putting this target on you, but not by non-believers, but by other Christians. There is no room for different interpretations of scripture. You can't go too deep into the human condition with more serious and difficult topics like sexuality, drug use, violence, or again, anything that isn't explicitly about God or Jesus. Reliant K, which is another band, was the source of controversy back in the day because they had Christian songs but they also had songs about romance or falling in love. It's something that Christians need to work on, but nobody wants to say that. So I totally get what he's saying. He can put Christian beliefs and themes into his films without pigeonholing himself trying to appease a very rigid and strict Christian-only audience, which can be very judgmental and relentless. It's funny to me because even these guys and their very conservative views get judged so harshly by their own viewers. The main guy that's, that talks throughout this uh, had got some tattoos before he became a Christian, one of which is like a star or a pentagram or something. And they had a community post promoting some of their t-shirts, which I actually really liked, not even sarcastically. They're actually really clever and I wish my t-shirt game was as strong as theirs. Anyway, you can see his tattoos and people in the comments were just criticizing the heck out of them. That's the type of stuff I'm talking about. Mind your business, mind your sins, work on the plank in your own eye, cast stones only if you don't have any sin yourself, which is not the case. You know, I disagree with these guys on a lot of their philosophy and their interpretation of film. We can debate that. I might even be too crass with my humor and my jokes sometimes, but at no point have I ever criticized the sincerity or the legitimacy of their belief, or if they're even Christians in the first place. Something that many of their viewers have not extended the same courtesy to me. Anyway, I'm getting salty now and not the salt of the earth kind of salt. They go on for a while criticizing Pete Doctor for being ashamed of his faith or whatever. Seems like Christians in film are the most disloyal people to their own faith. Oh, stop it, disloyal to their faith. There's something called tact. There's a way of going about converting people or exposing people to Christianity. Fundamentalist type typically have more of a quantity over quality approach when it comes to this. These are the types that stand on street corners and preach at people and when they're met with negativity, they're like, oh, I'm being persecuted for my faith or trying to spread the gospel. The Bible is pretty clear on street preaching. Jesus mentioned street preaching once and it was in a negative context. I mention this because, again, Pete Doctor says that his Christian faith influences his work. He says he doesn't want to lecture to people who are going to movies to be entertained, and they get offended because their perspective of spreading the gospel can be viewed as lecturing. They don't 
get that. It's the same reason people don't like being just approached out of the blue by somebody. Like when you're at the park or at the beach or just minding your own business and someone wants to come up and share the gospel with you and you just, you know, it's your one day off of work and you just want to be left alone. So it's not the gospel that's annoying, it's you. And I remember watching those clips of, of, of George Lucas and, and him talking about, hey, anybody in the media knows that you, you've got a microphone yeah. mm -hmm. and you've got a platform. You're teaching somebody something. Yep. What is it that you're teaching them? I agree with this to an extent. I think that there are messages in movies and movies preach or condone things at the very least. I think he gives a fair standpoint there. I also think that things should be criticized if they're wrong. For example, I hate this whole narrative of finding your truth that I'm starting to see in more movies lately, as if truth is subjective. And I criticize this standpoint when I see it in movies. Typically though, waving a Bible in a non-believer's face is not the best way to go about getting your point across. I also find it interesting that this guy brings up George Lucas and Star Wars a lot. When George Lucas himself so adamantly dislikes Hollywood and producers for trying to change or misconstrue or reconstruct his original ideas. They constantly use Star Wars as an example of how evil and bad Hollywood is, but totally discount that it was one guy, one guy's vision, completely self-funded, and was fully expected to fail by just about all of Hollywood. I was not happy with Hollywood. I didn't want anything to do with them. I, and I did never made a movie in Hollywood, actually. I've made them everywhere else but Hollywood. You know, I put my heart and soul in this thing, and to me, it, it means something. You know, you just come in here and whack a few fingers off and think there's nothing to it. I had, out of defense, acquired the sequel rights because they figured it wasn't going to go anywhere. But no, nobody thought it was going to make any money. So it was like half of nothing is nothing. Yeah. See? I, I kind of view a lot of what is coming out of Hollywood in two ways. It either leads you closer to God or it's leading you away. I actually agree with this a lot. But the difference is I think that I can find God in many movies. The lessons in many movies can have blatantly Christian influence and even Christian symbolism. I talked about this a little bit in my God in the MCU series and how Christians should want more of that type of thing. When we did uh, My Friend Watches Jojo Rabbit, I talked about how the little Nazi boy and his full character arc came around when he tied the shoes of the little Jewish girl at the end, and compared that to Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. There are several moments throughout the MCU that we talked about, like self-sacrifice for one's friends, an act Christ himself said that there is no greater love. In Spider-Man 3, the central theme was forgiveness. Back in my youth group days, I did a devotional on Spider-Man 3, this is true, uh, about how it had Christian imagery all throughout it. Uh, the symbiote representing sin, how it made him feel good in the moment and stronger, but slowly was destroying all the relationships around him. Peter's redemption in a church, and that even though he had let go of that symbiote and that sin, he still had to deal with the consequences of it. Finally forgiving Flint Marco for murdering his uncle. I mean, to say that there's just no Christian influence or nothing that Christians can gain from movies, I just disagree with it. And I think that there's demonstrable evidence to the contrary. Because I know people are gonna, you guys missed the whole point. No, I didn't miss the point. Every deception, all propaganda is wrapped up in something that you can identify with, that yeah. you can accept. What he ends up finding out at the end is, you know, don't focus so much on trying to reach that unob unobtainable goal. Just live in the moment, live in life, if, enjoy being a father, enjoy watching the leaves fall, you know, take a, I, I agree with that. Yeah, those are good concepts. There's nothing wrong with that. They did it. They got it. That's the whole point of the film. That's the whole point of the movie and they just said it themselves. What are we still doing here? What do we got to talk about? That's it. Appreciate you guys watching. It's the little deceptions that are thrown. It's the little bit of eyedropper of cyanide in that glass of ice cold lemonade. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh. Um, we did do a lot of research. We talked to rabbis and priests and Buddhists and all sorts of folks just to learn what we could. But, um, you know, most people said, oh, the souls are ethereal, ethereal they're non-physical, they're invisible. So what I think is interesting is he's a Christian. He doesn't want to make anybody mad by putting his own beliefs in there. But let's talk to every other religion in the world and let's throw a little bit of that into this. Well, he said he does put his Christian belief in there, just not explicitly. For example, forgiveness, again, is a central Christian theme. And so he incorporates that, essentially teaching people Christian values without telling them their Christian values. 
sneaky, sneaky. So they go on to talk some more about the plot of the movie. They discuss the great before and about how in the movie, this is where people go to find their spark and their passions. They talk about the counselor characters and they also have a hilariously long conversation about how Muhammad Ali and Carl Jung get to mentor 22 when Muhammad Ali should have been burning in hell because he's a Muslim and Carl Jung should have also been burning in hell because he was an atheist. What I wanted to bring out was Muhammad Ali is a Muslim. So a Muslim is in this world. And then Carl Jung, who's a Swiss psychologist and psychiatrist, he's in this world. So they take this so literally and they're like, well, this is universalism where you can do whatever you want and say whatever you want and live however you want. And there's no consequence. And just totally missing the joke. I've had thousands of mentors who failed and now hate me. Muhammad Ali. You are the greatest. Pain in the butt! Are we saying that all religions get to go to this place? It was just a joke. It, it was a joke in the movie. They weren't saying they know like where these people are or where they aren't in the afterlife, if they're in heaven or hell or wherever. They just thought it would be funny. I know that that's kind of a hard pill for them to swallow, I think. That filmmakers just put stuff in there because they think that it would be funny in that moment. And they look like so deep into it. Could you imagine if they showed like Muhammad Ali burning in hell in this Pixar movie? And these Christians being like, uh, see, that's so much better. Finally, a Christian movie. Are you ever gonna be in heaven and be like, I'm so much better than you? No. Are you ever gonna be like that? No. Never. It's just a joke, guys. They thought it would be funny to take his famous line and, and make a joke out of it. Just a joke. You are the greatest. Pain in the butt! They go on to talk about their issues with displaying non-Christians not burning in hell in the movie, claiming that if they're not Christians, we shouldn't admire or look up to them. I suppose that's a reasonable stance that can be broadly applied to every non-Christian. When the main character dies, his name's Joe Gardner. He, he finally gets his big break. He, he's like gonna be a, a replacement for somebody at a jazz a show immediately dies like really falls down he drops <laughs> and he turns into this blue ghost or whatever all he wants to do is like no i can't go to the great beyond i gotta get back to earth i gotta nobody wants to send him back to earth you know you gotta do this thing you got a mentor and they give him 22 who's the one who doesn't want to go to earth so they kind of like team up well okay you want you well, want to go back to earth and, there, he, remember he took someone's place he wasn't supposed to be a mentor oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah the shenanigans is that he was supposed to go to the great beyond but he was able to escape to the great before. That's that's our that's kind of our plot. There's a really funny pitch meetings about this movie that points to the actual plot holes in it that I think is really funny too. And she's like, I'm gonna show you these mystics. They literally call them mystics. Oh, wow. I'm gonna lead you to these mystics that I know they can help you get back to your body. And his name is Moon Wind. And here you see him very and hippie like, pose. and he's doing yeah yoga pose, doing the mudras. The Disney fandom says that his goal is to help souls find human bodies. So here's the other mystics that are with him, and this one here is always in the lotus pose, doing the hand mudras and floating, levitating everywhere he goes. He's gonna open a portal and send him back to his body. So how does he do it? Look, the closed caption that's actually on the screen, I didn't type this, he says, breathe into your crown chakra. He's telling the main character, breathe into your crown chakra. Then he's doing the mudra with both hands, they're both got their eyes closed. Can can they not tell that the filmmakers are clearly poking fun at this type of thing? They make the entire character of Moonwind a silly, aloof hippie with a dead-end job. Actual practitioners of new age mysticism would probably be offended by this, not honored by it. So it's funny to me that they get so caught up in the whole displaying of mysticism in this movie when the movie itself belittles it. And kids are kind of aware of the concept of heaven. You'd probably go to most kids and say, you know, hey, do you know what heaven is or, or would you like to go there? And a kid's probably gonna be like, yeah. Hey, you little seven-year-old, do you know what heaven is? Would you like to go there? I can arrange that. Yeah. Like this is a cult, man. And right. like, they just act like right. it's a joke or something. You know, he's getting it, man. They are treating it like it's a joke. I feel like they'd have more of a point if this movie was like dead serious about this kind of thing. If they were like, hey, you wanna put your spirit in places where it's not supposed to be? Chakras, right? But they diminish it. They don't even treat it seriously. If they treated Christianity the same way that they're treating new age mysticism in this movie, Christians would be offended. They're not promoting new age practice. They're making fun of it. We're probably one lone voice at no. the corner of the internet that even has a problem with this. Yeah, if you're watching Harry Potter or My Little Pony or all these things that are blatantly teaching you witchcraft, that's a religion. If you're watching this and it's teaching you 
New Age philosophy, that's a religion. And this Christian has made this movie saying, I don't want to put my beliefs in there, but I'm basically going to make a piece of New Age propaganda for your children. Well, the day I find a little girl legitimately trying to summon a sentient pony to her living room is the day I'll give you this point. But let's not misconstrue the beginning. I notice you guys do this a lot. You set a precedent at the beginning and then build upon that. The guy said he would never make a Christian movie, but he does say his Christianity influences his work. That is a far cry from I don't want to put my beliefs in there. That's just genuinely not true and misconstruing what he actually said. As far as promoting witchcraft because magic is in it, The Chronicles of Narnia. It's expressly Christian allegory written by one of the most influential Christian writers of the 20th century. Just because magic is in a story does not automatically mean it's promoting it. I need all Christians to understand that point. Or would you condemn 1 Samuel for having a witch? Does the Bible now promote witchcraft? There was a practicing witch in it after all. Of course you wouldn't say that because you understand the context therein. Look at the Christian church today. How many how many of those Christians are going to yoga class? How many of those Christians are playing with angel boards instead of Ouija boards and angel cards instead of tarot cards? Man, the church is being so deceived. Yoga, tarot cards, practicing balance and stretching, communicating with demons. Hmm. You're only going to know as much truth as you absorb. Are you reading your Bible every single day? Are you going to a church that teaches Bible-based teachings? You know, are you in some kind of study group? How is your prayer life? You know, all those things that add up. In your Christian experience, you just find, you know, the Bible's boring. Mm -hmm. I'd rather, you know, I can go to church on whatever morning and listen to a feel-good message and walk away, and, you know, then I'm gonna go out to eat after that. I get cautious with this sort of Christian legalism, but I get what he's saying. You need edification and practice in faith, and I agree with that. But this notion that you have to do X, Y, and Z to be a good Christian, I disagree with. They want to talk about the Bible being very clear about issues, well, the Bible is very clear about salvation. You know, John 3.16 only requires the belief in Jesus, or rather, the belief in who Jesus is. And then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household, this verse actually says. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. It is a gift freely given. No one can earn their way into heaven. No amount of Bible study, no amount of church attendance, not your theological views or opinions, so that no one may boast means that we're all on the same playing field when it comes to salvation. You cannot be good enough to get there. The Pharisees in the New Testament had this legalistic view. And I think many Christians come from a sincere place of just wanting Jesus to be proud of them, that they followed his commandments a little bit better maybe than some other Christians, that their personal sacrifices and their Christian walk is acknowledged in some way. In this attempt to be as good a Christian as they can be, they start to fall down this Pharisee hole. A Pharisee hole. I gotta use that. Judging and condemning other Christians for not following Jesus the way they think they should. Jesus gave a parable about two men who went into a temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, or we could say a legalistic uh, religious or Christian standpoint, and one was a tax collector. Back in those days especially, tax collectors were considered absolute trash by the people, often cheating them out of more money than they owed the government and then pocketing the rest. So if they owed like $500 in taxes, the tax collector would say, they actually owed 2,000, give 500 to the government and then pocket the 1,500. So these were garbage people. Anyway, the Pharisee kneels down and says, God, thank you so much that I'm not like those other people. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I earn. In other words, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. Surely God will look upon me favorably. What a good, what a good believer. What a good religious person. But the tax collector would not even approach or look up to heaven. He prayed, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said, God, look more favorably on that tax collector. My issue, my warning with fundamentalists and LED is that, is, is to not be like that. Thank God I'm not like these worldly people, that I don't watch these movies or listen to this music, that I'm not like those Muslims or those Mormons or those atheists. I abstain from sex and I go to church every Saturday. I used to think that they were Pentecostals, but I actually think they're Seventh-day Adventists now. I'm not entirely sure. Jesus is very clear about minding your own sin instead of worrying about the sins of others. This is why so many non-Christians or agnostics are on, are on the fence about Christianity because of 
all this perceived finger pointing and hypocrisy. It's why Pete Doctor says he doesn't want to come across as lecturing, but prefers his Christianity be organically felt in his films. And also why he pokes fun at New Age mysticism. The recurring theme in the New Testament, we see it again with the prodigal son, is that Jesus offers salvation and forgiveness for those that don't deserve it. Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. An acknowledgement of one's own faults and sins, asking forgiveness, and the personal decision on aligning oneself more closely to who Christ called us to be. For the Pharisee or the brother of the prodigal son, there was the sense of jealousy they had that they had done everything right, but in the end were less favored than their more sinful and less deserving counterpart. I wonder how many of these Christians will be upset when they get to heaven and see all the types of crappy people that made it in there and how unfair that is. After all, they did everything right. But the beauty of grace is that life's not fair. I also want to say this because, um, you know, we, we do engage with people who, who disagree vehemently with, with whatever angle we're kind of coming at this kind of stuff. That was for me, I'm like 90% sure. If you have a real heart for truth and you open your heart to God, it doesn't matter what we say. We're giving our, our perspective and our opinion, but at the end of the day, if you're coming to God saying, God, I wanna understand this topic, show me the truth. I agree 100% with this. I think that is a healthy approach for all Christians, and I appreciate him saying we're giving our thoughts and opinions based on our understanding of scripture. That, that's what we're all doing. We can all in interpret verses differently. I would argue some verses are more objective than others. Jesus spoke in parables, which by its nature leads to multiple interpretations. We're constantly learning about different contexts and verses, even translational issues that we have with the original he Hebrew or Greek, and how other words might be more appropriate to use in an English translation. To say that the way that I understand it is just the correct way, I think is foolhardy. So I appreciate the acknowledgement that much of this is opinion based off their, their understanding of scripture and not that their perspective is objective truth. That's always been my biggest issue with these guys is that their perspective on film or Marvel movies or whatever is the correct Christian view and that all Christians should have that same viewpoint. So thank you for that. It makes it easier for me personally to listen to what you have to say. But at the end of the day, if you're coming to God saying, God, I want to understand this topic, show me the truth. Yeah. I guarantee you God is not going to ignore you. No. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, always come to God with whatever you're learning from whatever YouTube Christian channel or whatever you're watching. Was that towards me again or am I just vain? And, and literally just, God, show me the, the truth in this. Show me the truth in this. And I believe he will direct your path. Preach, brother, preach it. See, we can agree on important stuff. I think that's perfect, yes. So they talk more about the movie, bringing up different articles, one of which is, Soul will open up the discussion to talk about God and your family, or talk about the afterlife in your family. I think it would, because you can then say, well, what do you think happens after you die? They argue that it doesn't really do that, but I think it does open up a doorway to discussion with that type of thing. They then go on to talk about pre-existent belief, meaning that you existed in some form before you were actually born. Everybody is like this pre-existent soul with a personality and all that, and then you get sent to Earth. I want to show you who believes that. And it says, is a belief that each individual human soul existed before mortal conception and at some point before birth enters or is placed into the body. But here's a Christian sect that does believe it. This comes straight off of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Look at their video. Where did we come from? We lived with God as spirits before we came to earth. We call this our pre-mortal life. God, our Heavenly Father, is the Father of our spirits. We are all brothers and sisters and part of His family. Next, we came here to Earth. Coming here was part of God's plan of happiness. First, we came to get a physical body. When we came to this world, our spirit joined together with the body. I believe that we need to have a physical body. God wants us to have a physical body, but I do not believe that we used to be some kind of spirit conscious out in heaven with the Father before we existed. I like how they show Mormons talking about this. I actually thought they would like the idea of pre-existence because they're pro-birth. And the idea of a human being have some form of sentience before 
being physically born would strengthen their argument against abortion. But they don't like it, even arguing that it diminishes the sacrifice of Christ. I think in, in, in a strange way, this also diminishes the, the gift that Jesus came down to this earth. By the way, I have to keep checking in because this whole movie is an abstract concept that is in no way saying that its portrayal of life or pre-existence is accurate at all. I'm just going along with their line of thinking. It, it says Jesus was with the Father before, right? Well, not directly. You can kind of piece that together with some verses that are in Revelation, but it doesn't explicitly say that, no. This is actually a topic that has a lot of disagreement among theologians, whether Jesus was with God from the beginning and therefore throughout the whole Old Testament, but I know that these guys definitely believe that. Jesus was with the Father before, right? So it doesn't say everyone was. I, I don't know if one verse that actually even says any of that. What about Jeremiah 1.5? Before you were in the womb, I knew you. Often used by pro-birthers, I thought these guys would be all over this. The verse that they use, the one that I sh saw in that video, they say, I knew you before you were in the womb. Hey, there it is. Though if you want to get really technical, God was actually talking to Jeremiah specifically and not the author to the reader, which is a way that a lot of scripture gets misconstrued and misinterpreted by believers. Not saying that God doesn't necessarily know you either, just that it was not author to reader meant to be translated, but rather a context within the actual story structure of that book. Anyways. Oh, we were friends with God before in the womb. <laughs> But God, That's tricky. Uh, yes, it is tricky. They go on to talk about the actual implications of being in the great before and why you would even choose to come to earth in the first place, basically agreeing with 22's logic. Again, they're treating this very literally as if the filmmakers are saying, this is how it works instead of it being an abstract story. With the point being, as this guy says, just live in the moment, live in life, if, enjoy being a father, enjoy watching the leaves fall, you know, take a, I, I agree with that. So then they go on with their usual stuff of pointing out stuff that has no substance at all, talking about Joe Gardner's name and dissecting his last name, Gardener, talking about how it means keeper of the garden, and how, wait, Adam was the keeper of the garden of Eden? What are they trying to say? It ends mostly with more stuff like that. I don't think I ever got to it in the God in the MCU series, but by the end of that, they were also like, Thanos is in a warship. Is that a play on the word worship? Warship, worship? Think about that for a little bit. Warship, play on words, warship, like worship, right? Man, good times, maybe I do need to finish that. They talk about a few more verses about how God breathes his life into people as the actual start of living. Uh, there's more stuff about them taking the abstraction of the film literally and not liking that and taking it as an affront to Christianity classic LED Live. So I want to end this with two things. The first is that using abstract storytelling to make a point is not evil. I've talked about C.S. Lewis in this video probably too much already and The Chronicles of Narnia, but he also did a book called The Great Divorce, and I highly recommend it. He gets very interesting perspectives on heaven and hell and how the reality of heaven is so much more real than our reality here on earth, as if what is to come is the true reality in our existence now. We are but ghosts in comparison to the reality that is heaven. That's just one thing. There's a ton of great stuff in there. I'm not really not doing it justice. There's a ton of great content and substance in there. It is expressly and explicitly Christian. It's weird I have to say that about C.S. Lewis, but there you go. You could think of it as the Christian version of soul, if you would like. The second thing is this sort of sexy tango we do back and forth. This Christian disagreement that we have. It reminds me of 1 Corinthians chapter 8. I'll give you the abbreviated version. As people in the early church were beginning to convert to Christianity, they were starting to phase out some of their other practices, trying to figure out what is right to do, what isn't right to do. One of the things that they used to do was sacrifice animals to false gods. So they were basically like, is it okay if we eat the food that was sacrificed to the false god? Would we be okay in doing that? And Paul essentially is like, well, food is really nothing, and we know that that there's only one God, so the false gods are essentially nothing too. So you're sacrificing nothing to nothing. So it's all good if you eat that food, my guys. But he goes on to say, but be careful, my dudes. A lot of people are still accustomed to sacrificing idols. And if they see Christians eating the food that was sacrificed, they may think it's still okay to still sacrifice food to those gods. So even though you know it's okay, you could still cause a weaker Christian to stumble in their Christian walk if they see you doing these things. I bring up this chapter because to me, my faith is secure. No movie or TV show will cause me to stumble in my faith because I know that I can process them as that, as just films. They're not reality to me. But I know that there are some people who are just more susceptible to movies or TV shows because of how real they may feel to them. They're more easily influenced by it, I guess. It would therefore be wrong of me to pressure 
other Christians into watching something that, that they may not feel is in their best interest. I had a coworker that was a devout Catholic and we were talking about the Daredevil series when it was coming out. And I remember talking to him one day if he caught like the, the new season or something. And he was telling me, actually, I've tried to step away from so much violence in the media that I consume. I've just noticed I've been watching too much violence in the movies and TV shows and it's just not good for me. And I totally got that. I totally understood that. So it would be wrong of me to be like, it's fine, dude. It's all good. It's not going to affect you because it might affect them in that way. So if watching something that has any form of spiritualism or content that is aside from Christianity threatens you as a believer, then don't watch it. I think that that's fair and right. It can be equally wrong for a Christian that has personal issues with a certain type of media to say consuming it is objectively wrong because it threatens me personally. In other words, to say because I can't handle it, it must therefore be wrong for everyone else too. But that's all I got for you today. Please Please don't go to their page and spam them with mean comments. I keep asking you guys not to do that, but you do it anyway. Please don't do that. It makes me look bad. It makes you look bad. And most importantly, it makes me look bad. The crew and I just finished watching Soul for the first time. If you want to see us react to that, you can do that here. Comment down below letting me know what you think. I know that there was a lot in this video and it's longer than, than typically is normal. Like this video if you enjoyed it. It helps my channel out a lot. Subscribe if you want to see more fun content like this. Ah, uh, so fun. <laughs> <laughs> Consider joining my Patreon to get early access to select videos, help support me as an independent content creator so I can make more fun videos like this. As always, I appreciate you watching, and God bless.